chosen, I am free, I am living for eternity. morning how are you guys doing this morning i don't know if you guys know this does anybody know that it is th gonna be thanksgiving here coming up who is gonna eat themselves into a food coma anybody oh two people that's awesome um well um i know with everything going on sometimes it's hard for us to focus on the things that we are thankful for because sometimes our circumstance just seems so overwhelming or the situation that we're in but um, I am thankful today for God's thank, uh, faithfulness Amen. and um, that he is always with us no matter what we're um, going through. So let's just continue um, to worship him as we sing about his faithfulness this morning.
honor him by giving him praise today. Thank you, praise team. Weren't these guys great? They were awesome, man. I was uh, I was thinking while we were singing that song, um, we obviously definitely want to honor him and praise him. And history is full of uh, accounts where a king has sent many times young men into battle to die for him. But how often do you see a king that dies for his own people? And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for Jesus today and and everything. Is he do, is he working in your life today? Boy, he'll, he'll make something. Uh, Bill Gaither, many years ago, wrote this song. He'll make something beautiful out of your life if you will let him. Well, guys, it's so good to see each one of you here today. And uh, I know that, uh, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. How many of you knew that? We had a little pandemic that's, uh, that's going on. And something else that's happened this year that you guys are probably totally unaware of. We had an election presidential election. <laughs> How many of you are about to recover your sanity from having to see everything in the, the media and, and uh, social media and, and, and such? And it's, I'm, I, I started to say, I, I'm glad it's over, but I don't think it's quite over yet. I think, uh, I think the lawyers got involved now. So uh, hopefully before I die of old age, we'll know who the president is. I, I think we know, but uh, anyway. But it's so good to see each one of you today. You know, we can't shake hands and and we can't we can't hug each other. But why don't you uh, turn to yourself and give yourself a high five this morning? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know how you do that. But that's. Uh, <laughs> but it is so good to have each one of you here today. So, we uh, we're doing a series called "What's So Amazing About Grace" and and. Uh, I tell you what, guys. Last Sunday was probably one of the most amazing sermons that you will ever hear. <laughs> Amen. How I many of you were here last Sunday? Well, if you weren't, you can go back on the YouTube channel and and you can watch it. And but but it's it's amazing not because I had anything to do with it. It's amazing because it's it's a story of God's grace in our lives, and I am so thankful for His grace. That is my only hope. That's my only hope for now and the future is God's. Grace. So we're talking about what's so amazing about grace. John chapter 1, verse 17. We'll probably read this verse every, uh, every Sunday morning as while we're in this series. Uh, John writes this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that grace and truth that comes through him. So in our study today, I want to uh, we're going to focus uh, we're going to focus on a, a, a probably the greatest king, one of the greatest kings that's ever lived, and maybe the greatest king in the nation of Israel, and that's that's King David. Oftentimes, uh, when I when I study Scripture, there's different ways that you can do it, different approaches. And one thing that I like to do is I like to study the, the biographies of certain men and and even women. In Scripture, I, to me, I find I find people's story interesting. So, if you and I have an opportunity, maybe at a church fellowship or something, and we're sitting at the same table, um, I'm not being a stalker. I'm not being nosy. Well, maybe just a little bit, but I'd like to hear people's story, uh, especially the story of how they how they came to Christ. And uh, in study, studying Scripture, sometimes it will it will. Uh, it, it will help you to stay interested in a particular study if you're just not like trying to memorize facts or whatever. And, and, and admittedly, some of the Old Testament is a little rough to read. You know, you read, how many of you have ever tried to read the Bible through in one year? How many of you tried to do that? How many of you actually have done it? <laughs> okay. All right. That was just about the same. So great. I'm glad that. Uh, and so, and I, I do that occasionally, and and you finally get to Leviticus, and boy, it kind of it kind of drags a little bit through Leviticus. You think, whew, Leviticus is over, and then all of a sudden you're in Numbers, which is worse. 
And but you just kind of some of that you just kind of speed read through and, and you get to it's all good. It's all inspired. And, and a lot of times God will drop a nugget of truth right in the middle of those uh, of the genealogies or of the, the list of the people and their descendants and all that type of stuff. And and but once you get past through that, it's a great message. Aren't you thankful that the Bible is God's love story? It's 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 a story of God's love. For God so loved the world, he gave his own son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And we see his love, we recognize his love through his grace that is extended unto us. Let's talk about David for just a moment. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, we read these words. Now, there was a king on the throne, the first king of Israel, a king by the name of Saul, who started off good, but it didn't take him very long before he got off the rails, went a little bit of sideways, found himself in disobedience to the plan of God. How many of you know that when you become disobedient in your life in any way to God's plan for your life, it really turns out badly? I want to tell you the quickest way to get your life derailed and get your life into a mess is begin to pursue your own plan for your life. God's got an amazing plan. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11, read it, memorize it, because God reveals to us that he's got a plan to bless us, a plan for our hope and future and not for our, our harm. But there was one king uh, that was sitting upon the throne by the name of Saul, but God had another young man in mind. And so God speaking to the prophet says this, 1 Samuel Chapter 13, verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. Speaking to the first king, Saul, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So we know that David, and I think that is such a, such a powerful statement over the life of of David, he was a man after God's own heart. Now, that's interesting because when you look at the life of David, David was hardly an example to us, and we're going to talk about several occasions in his life. But one thing we know about David, he figures prominently, in, not only in the Old Testament, which we read most of his story, the end of 1 Samuel into 2 Samuel, we read the story of his life and his ministry as king, but he also figures prominently in the New Testament. This man, after God's own heart, was probably the greatest king that ever lived. David, David was a lot of things. He was, he was sort of uh, a contradiction in terms. He was a man after God's own heart, God's own heart, but guys, you wouldn't want to trust him with your wife. Can I get an amen? How many of you have read? <laughs> David, the Bible says David was a handsome man. David was a ladies' man. And got himself in into trouble, but he was he was a great king, and 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 we that's revealed to us in the Old Testament. But it's interesting because in the New Testament, Jesus, you know, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus had a number of names. What was a name for Jesus in the in the gospel? Somebody help me out. Help me in my sermon here today. He was the Messiah. What else? Son of Man. What else? Okay, y'all speaking in tongues. I did not understand that at all. Emmanuel. There, there's a lot of names, but there's, there's one name that, that often we forget. He's referred to as, Jesus is referred to as the son of David. David is everywhere in Scripture. In fact, you find his name in 28 books of the Bible. And he begins, the first, uh, the first mention that we really have of his name is in the book of Ruth, and we're going to turn there to Ruth chapter 4. But David is listed from the book of Ruth all the way to the book of Revelation, where he's mentioned three times in the book of Revelation. So let's turn to, to Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. Now, this is a story. How many single ladies do we have here today? Okay. Uh, single ladies. This is, this is your story. This is the story of Ruth and Boaz. And all the church ladies know about Boaz. Let me tell you a little something about Boaz. The Bible says that Boaz was a handsome man. He was a rich man. He was a, he was a man of integrity. And every woman that sits in church that's single for any period of time is looking for her 
Boaz. Well, we're, we're coming to the, the final chapter of the book of Ruth, and, and we read verse 13 says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. How many of you just love a really good love story? Man, turn, turn some time and read the book of, of Ruth. It's just a great story. Ruth was, a, w- Ruth was an incredible woman devoted to her mother-in-law and, and such, and she stayed with her instead of going back with her own people. She had been married to Naomi's son, and, and um, it's just a great story. So anyway, long story short, she meets Boaz. She gets her Boaz, and she becomes his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And then the, the, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. And he shall be to you a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. It's obviously her grandson. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse. And here's the first mention we have of David, the father of David. So many feel the significance of the book of Ruth is Ruth finding her Boaz. And, you you know, how many of you love, how many of you men like to watch the Hallmark Channel, those love stories, but you get your wife to sit down with you just so you don't have to give up your man card? How many guys? Come on, guys. How many? This is a great story, and a lot of people think, a lot of people think that this story was really about Ruth finding her Boaz. And obviously that is the narrative that we find there. And we, we see all the qualities that Boaz was handsome and wealthy and kind. But I want to tell you, ladies, something. If you're looking for a Boaz, you got to be more like Ruth and less like Delilah. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Can I get an amen here today? So, so, I, so all the ladies said, oh, my gosh, this is the book of Ruth is about me finding my Boaz. But really it's not. The story about Ruth and Boaz, I mean, that's, it's a great story, and you can learn a lot from it, ladies. And guys, you can too by trying to be a good, a good guy, you know, or whatever. But really, the whole significance of Ruth is to introduce us to King David, this man after God's own heart. It all points to David the king. Why? You know, when we, when, when we see the, the mistakes and the, and the failures and the faults in the life of King David, how could he be referred to as a man after God's own heart? Because of grace. That's what's so amazing about grace. Second Samuel chapter 11 tells us a story of the humanity of David. And David, in the, the, the first verse of Second, uh, Second Samuel chapter 11, it says that when the king's at the time of year when the kings went out to battle, David stayed at home. And in the evening, he goes out in his porch, and he looks across the way, and he sees this beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba, and she was bathing. David summoned her, and as a result of their one night together, she becomes pregnant. There's a, there's a verse in the Old Testament I believe it was Moses speaking to the people of Israel. The children of Israel said, be sure that your sin will find you out. And this great king, a man who was literally a man after God's own heart, steps out on the balcony and he sees this beautiful woman bathing and he calls for her, he summons her. And as a result of that one night, she becomes pregnant. And so now David David is in panic mode, and he's trying to figure out a way to cover up his sin. And so he sends for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. The thing that adds insult to injury is the fact that Uriah was one of his brave warriors that was out to battle. David should have been out to battle. But you know the thing that was amazing about David? You know, David as a king was a warrior. You didn't mess around with David. He was pretty much undefeated. Do you remember there was tremendous animosity between him and the first king? Not, not from David's side because David was a loyal subject and a, a loyal servant to King Saul. 
But David is a very young man after defeating Goliath, and he was elevated to be like the general of the armies. And when David would come back from battle, he would be met by the women from the city, and they would sing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. David was a warrior. He was one bad dude. And yet, here he finds himself trying to cover up this this terrible, terrible sin. So he calls for Uriah to come home, thinking that Uriah has not been in the company of his wife for a long time, that Uriah will spend the night with her. And then when she turns up pregnant, everyone will think that it's Uriah's baby. But you know, the thing about it is Uriah didn't even go home and spend the night with his wife. He stayed with the soldiers that were protecting David. Could you imagine this man who was so honorable, he would not even go home to the comforts of his wife, but he stayed there loyal to his king who had, ju- who had betrayed him, and, and Uriah didn't know. This didn't work, and so it just gets worse for David. When Uriah is sent back to fight under Joab, David sends a letter by Uriah's own hand to put Uriah at the front of the battle and then withdraw and let him be killed. So not only was David an adulterer, but now he's a murderer. He's having Uriah killed so that he can take Bathsheba to be his wife. And according to the plan, it worked out just that way. Uriah was killed. This guy was honorable. This guy, and you read Scripture, he's listed as one of the, one of the great soldiers and warriors for the nation of Israel. And yet David betrayed him. How could David, a man after God's own heart, and yet commit such horrible acts? He was only a man after God's own heart because of God's grace. Now we turn over in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, and we're reading about the royal line of Jesus. You know, that's what Matthew chapter 1, and it's the genealogy, it's the line, the ancestral line of Jesus of Nazareth. And we find these words beginning in verse number 5, and Salmon, the father of Boaz. And we've just talked about Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. Now, now notice this. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. That's grace. You see, because even though, even though David had sinned, and then he committed another sin by having Uriah put to death so he could take Bathsheba and try to make it honorable, yet God saw all this. But David was a man after God's own heart because he knew how to repent. You turn sometime and read Psalms 55. That was a psalm that David wrote in in confronting his own sin. And the thing about David, I think one of the reasons that made him a man after God's own heart is because he knew how to repent. Our society today, nobody wants to take responsibility for their own life. They're all, we always want to blame someone else. Well, it's somebody else's fault for the, for the place I'm in. But, guys, you're in the place today you are because you choose to be there. It's nobody else's fault. People can take you to a bad place. You may have been taken to a bad place as a child to terrible parenting. You may have been taken to a bad place as a result of an abusive relationship. But you have the choice of whether you want to stay there tonight, uh, stay there today, because God's grace will lift you up and will elevate you, and God will bless you, and God will show his mercy unto you if you will allow him. So God even blessed David and Bathsheba because they repented. Now, I just want to add this very quickly. Lest you think that there's no, con- <coughs> excuse me, no consequences to sin. As a result of David and Bathsheba's sin, their first child that they had together died. The child of that adulterous affair did not survive. And David, when that that baby was born sick, the Bible says that David wept and he fasted and he prayed and he asked God, please don't take this child. But yet that child, God allowed that child to die. Not only was that the result of that adulterous affair, but in David's family, there are horrible consequences that played out. He had a son by the name of Amnon who raped his half-sister Tamar. And then Tamar's brother, and these were, these were half-brothers and sisters by different wives, 
uh, uh, Amnon was later then killed by Absalom, who later briefly took the throne, and he was eventually killed by Joab. David received grace, but you know, and he he received forgiveness. But how many of you know there's actions to your there are there's consequences to your actions, and and these horrible circumstances, these. These, these situations played out in the lives of David's children. David was a great king, but he wasn't a great father. And these situations that played out in his family, he was an absent father too often. And they played out, and there was such destruction. The Bible says we have to be careful because whatever you reap, that's what you're, or whatever you sow, rather, that's what you're going to reap. And if you reap to the wind, you're going to or sow to the wind, you're going to reap a whirlwind. And David saw this play out. And, and David suffered tremendous heartbreak and grief over the life of his two sons, Amnon, who was killed by Absalom. And Absalom, who tried to take over the throne from his father, David, and then, in fact, was trying to, to shame David by taking and sleeping with David's concubines. It was a horrible situation. It was a terrible situation. You say, well, how in the world? How in the world could David be a, a man after God's own heart? David was a man after God's own heart because he knew how to receive grace and forgiveness. But not only that, he also, David also extended grace. I think this next story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 tells us everything we need to know about the type of person that David was. Now, many of you, if you know the story of that transition between Saul, the first king, and David, the second king. You know, it was not a smooth transition. It was very difficult. You know, in that time, it was um, uh, basically the strongest ruled. And when a king, survival of the fittest, and when a king took over, when a king was able to conquer a territory, he would go through and he would, he would kill. If the first king survived the battle, he would kill that king, kill all of the family, kill all of the descendants, totally try to eradicate that family off the face of the earth because they wanted to solidify their power. And, and uh, Saul, was, Saul was killed on the battlefield. Jonathan, his son, was killed on the battlefield. The descendants of Saul were scattered. And David, when he took, assumed the throne. And, and uh, in those early days, he was a, that man after God's own heart until he, he stumbled and fell with Bathsheba. And in those early days, because he was a man after God's own heart, we read this story. David said, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? I mean, this was so contrary to what kings did in that day. If it had been any other king, the question would have been different. Is there anyone in the house of Saul that I may annihilate them? I will destroy them. But that's not what David said. Verse 2, now there was a, a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Mature, of the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And when King David sent and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Amiel at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father and you shall eat at my table always and he paid homage and said what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I you can imagine Mephibosheth was the grandson of the first king Saul he understand how things worked. He understand how it worked in the real world. And when he first found out David was looking for a descendant of his, his grandfather Saul, I'm sure he was very fearful. He thought that he was going, uh, to, he thought he was going to be killed and, and what was left of the family was going to be annihilated. But yet David was not seeking him out to destroy him. David was seeking him out to show kindness. I, I, to me, that's one of the greatest examples of grace. In scripture. I don't know about you, but I see myself as Mephibosheth. 
The Bible says, and we, we, we know from earlier in, in the reading, that when he was a little boy, he was dropped uh, as, as the kingdom fell. And the lady that was taking care of him dropped him. And when she dropped him, his, his feet and legs were so damaged. And, of course, obviously they didn't have the medical treatments and abilities like they have today. And so his legs didn't heal right, and so he was lame. He couldn't walk. I can so identify with Mephibosheth. Because I, I wish I could stand up here and say, hey, guys, guess what? Your pastor has it all together. I got it going on. But, but every year I get older, and I'll be 36 this year, but every year that goes by, I recognize how broken and how damaged that I, I know I got a lion spirit. <laughs> Some of you look at mm, I don't think maybe 63, but he ain't no 36. But, but as time goes by, I recognize how broken and how damaged that I am. And I think that's all of us today in this place. If somebody is a visitor and maybe checking us out on YouTube or, or was looking for the perfect church or looking for a place where people had it all together, this is not the place. We're just a group of people that are broken, that are hurting, held, held together by the love of God and by his grace. And David reached out, and he reached out to this descendant of, of King Saul, the first king, Mephibosheth. And David said, don't, don't worry, I, I, am not, I haven't come to destroy you, but I've come. I want to restore to you, not because you deserve it. There was nothing about Mephibosheth that would have been attractive. There's no way he would have ever been considered as a king because he was, he was crippled. There's no way he could lead anybody into battle. And yet David, because of the kindness in his heart, because he was a man after God's own heart, why? He was changed because he had received grace, and now he was extending grace. If you really want to know where you're at in this pursuit of grace, start looking for people to bless that could never pay you back. David, you know what he did? Basically, when he had enemies, he destroyed them. But you know what Jesus told us to do? He said, pray for your enemies. Bless those that curse you. I want to encourage you today. Be a person. Be a man or a woman of grace. Experience his grace in your life today. Maybe your sins are not as bad as David's that committed adultery and then he murdered. He murdered the girl's, uh, the lady's husband. And maybe your sins are not in the eyes of man. Maybe not that bad. But I'm going to tell you something. All, all sin is sin. And James wrote in his writing that said, if you're guilty in one area of the law, you're guilty of all of it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I am thankful this morning, whatever, wherever you've been, whatever mistakes you've made, whatever sins you've committed, you can find forgiveness today. Not because you join a church or you attend a church or not because of anything you've done, but because of it's a free gift of God. It's not of works, Paul said, lest any man should boast. Receive his grace. But some of you here today have been wounded things that people have spoken into your life. Maybe it was an ex-spouse. Maybe, maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a step-parent. People have spoken into your life, spoken words over to your life, and they've hurt you. And maybe that happened years and years ago, and yet that, those same words play over and over and over in your mind. I want to tell you something. You can find healing today when you forgive and you extend grace just extend grace. Just when people bump up against you, when people bump up against you, whatever is filling you up is going to spill all out. And if you're angry and you're bitter and you're frustrated about life and, and, and you got bitter beer face <laughs> all the time, you know, I mean, it's like that's just what's going to that's just what's going to spill out. But if you'll just allow God to fill you full of his grace. And when people bump into you, you'll be able to smile and you'll be able to extend kindness. Because how many of you know, if you want to, def to defeat your enemies, the most powerful weapon that you have is kindness. Love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us, love never fails. In closing, I'll just say this. None of us are going to walk in perfection. But what we aspire to in our church family is we walk in love because love covers a, mult, a multitude of sins. Aren't you thankful for his grace today? Receive his grace. 
share his grace and be, let's just be people of grace and we'll be people after God's own heart. Father, thank you so much for your grace. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. And as we leave this place today, I pray, God, that our hearts will be full of gratitude for everything that you've done for us. And just as you have forgiven us, I pray, God, that we would have the grace to forgive others. And just let things go and realize, God, that all things work together for good. And even the things that people have intended to harm us, what man has intended for harm, God will turn it for our good. Thank you for grace. Help us to extend that grace and love to others, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless.